as you know, Lauren Hutchinson is speaking today, but by the end of this talk, you might just want to refer to her as Hutch or Hutchy, because that's how she greets and she introduces herself to all of her friends. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't ever meet a stranger. If you meet Hutch in person, you can feel her love. You can feel her openness. You can feel her expressiveness. You can see her determination. You can see her drive. And she's one of the most open to seeing souls I've ever known in my life. You can read about her bio. It's on the Creative Morning site. Um, when I first met Hutch, I knew she <laughs> played for Trinidad and Tobago's senior national women's team. I knew she ran multiple based, you know, multiple soccer organizations for youth, um, but she's not a coach in that way. She makes the impossible possible for people she meets. And I am thrilled to introduce this beautiful human and my friend, Hutch, to speak to you today on Insecure. Take it away, Hachi. Oh, thank you. I could just give you a big hug or I could just walk down the hallway, but... Um, we can't I'm even just, hug. We did this this morning. No. <laughs> With permission at a later We blew date. kisses yeah. via mask morning when we when we saw each other um before i get started with the talk i just want to say thank you to everybody um i i was scrolling through the gallery and i was like wow i see all my people here i see my friends i see some of my athletes um you know my people are here and before before i get in creative mornings thank you guys so much if you guys have not experienced creative mornings uh yet whether it's virtual or in person these guys are awesome. These ladies are awesome. This whole organization is amazing. And I just, I have to express my gratitude for you guys because you, you go above and beyond. And thank you to all the, the local and the global partners that, that make this happen. Um, so from the bottom of my heart, I'm just so grateful uh, for that. For a few housekeeping rules for me, remember you guys that this is a safe place. All right. I tell my athletes, I tell, you know, the entrepreneurs that I work with, my friends, my family, this is a safe place for you to bring your baggage. Anytime you're around me, a lot of people say, you know, leave your problems at home, leave it at the door. When you, when you, when you get here, no, you can bring it. You can bring it here. Let's experience it together. Let's feel it together. Um, that is when the most raw versions of ourself come out. So I, I want you to know that it is okay to feel those emotions today during the talk. And let's just please be respectful of everybody about how they feel, the comments that are put in the chat. Um, if I do say something that you just love, something that resonates with you or something that you need to tell somebody or, or that just the light bulb went off in your head, I would love for you to go to the chat and just type Hutch, H-U-T-C-H. If, it, if, if I'm dropping dimes, if I'm dropping gold, just type hutch. I want to know if, if I said something that, that, that really connected with you. So thank you so much. Um, for those that know me, for those that know me, everybody knows I bring my energy. Everybody knows I bring my authenticity and a lot of motivation. I've spoken all over the world. Uh, virtually, in person, kids, teens, adults, uh, everybody. And I'm used to giving the motivational talk. And, you know, eight months ago, Michelle, when we went and I talked with Creative Mornings, they were like, listen, we want this to be a vulnerable talk. We know that you can give a motivational talk. We know that you can get people hype. So me being vulnerable past what I'm used to giving is very different. I have never given a speech like this before. So if I get emotional, it's because I've never spoken about this in front of a group before. I've only, you know, maybe talked about it with one person in the room or just one on one, but this is going to be, this is, this is going to be tough for me. Um, 
So this is this is my this is my vulnerable talk. Uh, let me just make sure I got all through my my housekeeping rules. Okay, great, awesome. Don't need that anymore. All right. Um, so we're talking on insecurity today, and you know, I went to go write this talk, and I like couldn't do it. I, I remember being with Michelle and just and just feeling the emotions that were coming up, and she she really helped me go deeper. And what I've decided to do is share many micro stories through my childhood, my teenage years, my adulthood. And then now, so you guys can feel and experience insecurity with me. And hopefully it will bring up some things for you too. So you can, you can tackle that, that, that new level with that new devil. All right. It's very, very important that we dig deep sometimes so we can feel things that we have have suppressed over time. And people, people that know me are like, man, Hutch, so confident, you know, always out there, always giving for others. But I too have a lot of insecurity. I too have been through a lot. And these mini micro stories, I hope it shows you what insecurity means for me and what it what it has felt like over time. So um Ah, I can already feel the emotions coming up for me. So uh, what does insecurity mean to me it, or feel to me? It's, um, it's 2004. It's, it's, um, I remember being 12, 13, going to, I, I remember I used to ask my mom and my dad, could I just have $4 so I could go to the basketball games at the high school? And the soccer games and I would watch and I would take notes on the players, the, the, the sophomores, the juniors, the seniors that I wanted to play with. I remember sitting in the stands, sitting up high in the bleachers, traveling to different high schools just to watch them play because I, I was going to get to play with them someday. And I remember my freshman year in, in high school, it was, I was still very young. I was 13, 14. And um, I was the only freshman to make varsity sports in the entire school. And while that seems awesome, it was also one of the worst experiences of my life. Um, it, um, this is hard for me. Um, but I, these were people that, you know, I had looked up to for years as a young girl, and um, I know my mom's on this call, so she, she can feel this as well, but, you know, being a freshman on a, on, a, on a team where you have people that are 16, 17, 18 years old, many, many years older than me, I, I was so excited, and I was starting as a freshman, and I just seemed always so, so different from them and so distant. And I remember one day I, we had finished practice and I walked into the locker room and people were laughing and looking at me and I just felt this very weird energy in the room. And um, I, everyone was just kind of staring at me and the, a few, few players left because I could tell they felt uncomfortable. And when I got to my locker, um, I, I froze. Um, it was very hard. I opened my locker to man, just pictures of, of inappropriate naked women. And um, they used to write notes and call me gay and fag. And um, I just remember it uh, like falling out of my locker and then laughing even more and running out and, and then thinking it was a joke. And I just, I froze at such a young age for people that I, I had looked up to I, I couldn't believe it. And it, it, the worst part was that I was lying to myself. I was, um, I, 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 I pushed it down. I was like, this is not true. This is not real. I, 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 I don't like girls and you know, this is weird. And why are these people doing this to me? And I, I, I became very angry. Um, so I separated myself and I was still performing very well on the basketball court and, and, and for the high school, but it, it was a very polarizing time. And then, you know, in the same season, I was, um, you know, we were on the bus home 
from, from, a, from a game. I used to listen to Linkin Park all the time. Like that's all I listened to was my, I have my, my, my CD player, my headset. For my athletes that don't know what that is right now that are on this call, go look it up, what a CD player is. And um, I, I remember I was sitting in the front of the bus and they, they, the seniors would throw paper at the back of my head, um, same notes, same, same inappropriate notes. And I got so angry that I stood up and I screamed at all of them in the back of the bus to just leave me alone. To just, just don't worry about me, to not, to not, you know, I'm none of their business. And my coach, my, my basketball coach, you know, stood up on the bus and was like, what is going on? What's going on? And, and, and what was worse, what was worse was that next week having to sit in my athletic director's office with the seniors on the team. And they were so angry at me for snitching on that, like snitching on them and for exposing them. They, they were forced to apologize to me, even though they, they, they weren't apologetic. And then what was even worse was that was having to sit down with my parents, lie to myself and, and lie to them about who I really was, even though I still didn't understand who I was. Um, you know, so throughout you know, that 2005 to 2008 time, I was in the, I was in the recruiting process of, of going to play soccer in college, which was an awesome experience for me. My college coaches are on this call right now. And I know they know a lot of this too in, in, in the emotions that I experienced. But I was in the recruiting process while I was battling these insecurities and the rejection. And it was very hard. I mean, I was, my mom can contest to this. I was leaving the house in a dress and changing into shorts and a t-shirt. I was leaving the house with my hair down. And as soon as I got to the bathroom, I would tie it up in, in a bun. I don't have a bun anymore, but um, you know, I, those are the moments I would time my walks in the hallways because teachers were, were following me because that type of behavior wasn't allowed in, in, in my household at the time. And just another thing, you guys, for anyone that knows, knows my parents now, <laughs> completely different people. They're absolutely, they've always been amazing, but they support me 100%. But at the time it was a very tough time for all of us. Um, but yeah, I had to tie my walks in the hallways because teachers would follow me to make sure that I wasn't acting on those behaviors. I would have my guy friends walk with me, walk close to me, so I could paint this picture and this persona for people that no one knew, something that I didn't even know yet. And I remember when I was finally getting recruited, um, a school, you know, VCU, Tim and Tipsa, hey, that car on the call, like I said, came out of nowhere and they emailed me and they were like, Hutch, we saw you play. We, we re really want to bring you on campus. And I was like, who are these people? I looked them up. Um, unbelievable people, unbelievable accolades that played for the United States and for UNC, uh, World Cup athletes, Olympic athletes that wanted me to come play for their school. And at this time, like I said, I was still lying to myself, lying to my parents, lying to my friends and my family. And I remember going on my recruiting trip and Tim and Tim can contest to this. I went to the bookstore. I, I bought all the VCU gear. I wasn't even committed to the school yet. But I remember going, I remember walking down Broad Street and I was like, oh my God, this, this is where I belong. This, this feeling of being accepted, seeing the different types of people, the different genders, the different uh, colors, the different shades, the different sizes. It was, I, I felt at home. And when I walked into Tim and Tiff's office, like I wanted to commit. They, haven't, they hadn't even opened their mouths and I could tell the feeling that they that they exuded in the team. Long story short, I think I left their office and committed on the phone like five minutes later. I knew that that was the, the, the place for me um, to be. So, I, you know, I'm obviously still in high school. I committed to the school. I come home. I'm still running around doing my thing, uh, having relationships, falling in love. And I remember the next story, and this was, between, like I said, between 2004, 2008, 2009. I remember coming home.
from somewhere. I'm not really sure where I was coming home from, but once again, I got to the edge of my room and I opened my door and everything in my, my room was gone. At the time, my dad wasn't living with us. So it was my mom's apartment. And it was the, um, oh, here we go again. <laughs> it was the, um, the same energy that I felt in the locker room. And um, I just, I braced myself. Cause I felt so alone. And I, and I remember my dad coming out of the corner and he, he didn't live there. And I just, it's like my body went numb. And he, you know, he grabbed me by my sweatshirt. It was my VCU sweatshirt that I had bought in, at that recruiting trip and it ripped. It took me into my mom's room and um, they just, I, I actually don't even really remember a lot of the things they told me, but they just, they told me essentially that I, I don't, I shouldn't go to school and I shouldn't, I don't belong there. And um, I remember my brother crying. <laughs> Um, and like, once again, you know, going through the whole, okay, I'm good. Like I, I'm good. I, I, I lying to myself, lying to them, lying to my brother, lying to my friends. And it just, it was very hard for me. Cause I, I still wasn't even accepting myself. I wasn't even showing up for myself. It was the insecurity of the fear of me not being able to be authentic on the outside as authentic I was on the inside of, of being who I wanted to be and loving who I wanted to love. Um, so fast forward to my, my, my freshman year in college with, with Tim and Tiff, I, I had told myself the minute I, I moved on campus, there's no more showing up for just others. It's about showing up for myself now. I'm going to, whether they, my parents accept me, my brother, I, you know, he was very young at the time, so he didn't really understand what was going on, but anybody that didn't want to accept me from then on out, I unfortunately had to be okay with that and not lie to myself and not lie to people anymore. And I remember getting a call from my parents and um, it was some, from some Facebook post that I had posted that a, fa a distant family member had seen that told my parents and my parents were like, you're done. Don't come home. Like we told you before, this behavior of, of, of being with girls is not okay. You've lied so many times. Do not come home. Stop. You're not allowed to talk to your brother. Um, and I remember meeting with Tim and Tiff and I was like, I have nowhere to go. You know, I have, I, I don't know what to do, but this was the first time that I told them, fine, I won't. And this is not going to change. And I think the minute once I stood up for myself was the minute that the, the, we all turned the corner as a family. I turned the corner as a person, as a leader on my team as a person just for myself. And I think it, my mom, I'm sure my mom can write in the chat, but my mom, it, it took her no time. When I said that, she, she showed up within like three weeks. She's like, I can't do this. You're my daughter. You, you are everything to me. And you're right, it shouldn't matter who you love. Um, and, and she just could not handle it. And, and I think it was one of the people that I had been dating at the time that really helped her realize that it was okay to be gay. It was okay to uh, be who I was. And they became very, very close. And my mom, you know, if, like I said, if anybody knows my mom, my mom, like, might be a little gay now. Like, she might, <laughs> she waves the flag. She, she, she's constantly asking me stuff. She wants, she, I would take her. Sorry, this wasn't even on my like my like my story, but like we would go to the gay clubs together. She would she would come take shots with us and my friends, go to drag show. Like she just she embodied me, but only once I showed up for myself. Only one when, when I was able to really take it to the next level and show people who I really was. 
And as for my dad, it was the same situation. I always say my dad is just a few years behind, and I think he's on this call too, a few years behind my mom emotionally. Uh, there was another person that I was dating um, that he really connected with and that, that turned the corner for him. And once again, he's now waving the flags, trying to wear the rainbow, everything. Like he's awesome, you know, but he didn't, he couldn't show up for me until I showed up for myself. You know, my parents grew up, my dad grew up in Trinidad. My, my, my mom grew up in Ohio, very different cultures. So I had to show up for them so they could show up for me. Um, and, and being at school with Tim and Tiff, I rem like I said, I remember sitting in their office and they were just like, we're so happy that you could share these things with, with us. And they were the first people to really see me, all of me, not just parts of me not just the hutch that you see on Instagram that's energetic and excited. Like Tim and Tiff and I have cried multiple times. They were the people that really saw me first and really helped me explain to my parents and my friends and my family who I really was and what was really down deep. Um, so I'm very grateful for them. And, uh, you know, now moving into my professional career when I work with my athletes, when I work with my other entrepreneurs and I, and I work with other people that are in the corporate world or nine to fives is I had to be very careful because there would be situations where I felt that rejection again and that insecurity came up from my childhood. It, you know, I would be, you know, people would be like, oh, well, we can't do this because that's a little much or you're too much or you're too this. And then I would, I would go back in and do that thing that I do when I do that thing of, all right, I'm going to show up for them and I'm not going to show up for myself. I need to make other people happy. I got so used to coping as a child for showing up for other people. So other people felt comfortable that it started to bleed into my, my young adulthood and my, in my adulthood now where if someone felt uncomfortable with who I was, what I did, how I did it. I would have to change quickly and pivot and show up for them. And in writing this story and really digging deep on this vulnerable talk more than just a motivational talk, once again, you guys, the, the insecurity that I was experiencing wasn't from the rejection of, of being rejected by others. It was the fear of me rejecting myself. That's where the insecurity came from. It was, it was the insecurity of living unaligned. I have no control over how people feel. So why should I have to give them the power? I have to, I had to start showing up for myself because if I didn't, those old wounds would stay wounds. You know, the wounds needed to heal. I never gave them real time to heal properly. So that's why I let it bleed into my professional, you know, career and my, my, some of my professional situations. And one of my clients that I work with right now, shout out to you, Crystal. You, she said it the other day. She's like, you know, 30 people show up on my Zoom call. I'm going to show up. Nobody shows up on my Zoom call. I don't even show up. I have to show up all the time for myself all the time, every single day. Doesn't matter if there's one person on the call, no people on the call, thousands of people on the call. Showing up for yourself is the best thing that you can do. Showing up for yourself and going all in on you is the best thing that you can do for anybody else in this world. People are gonna love you and hate you for the same reason, so why wouldn't, just, why wouldn't you just be yourself? People will love you and hate you for the same reason. So just be yourself. And I know that is difficult because sometimes we have to dig extremely, extremely, extremely deep to find out who that is and what that is. So I have one small activity that I would love everybody for everybody to do. If you're driving, pull over. <laughs> if you're in the shower, get out the shower quickly. Um, if, if you could just get onto your phone or get a piece of paper or a pen, I would love everybody to do this. So I'm going to give you 60 seconds to get a piece of paper or to get your phone, your phone ready or your notes ready or something. Cause when I say the, the, the task, I want you to go. I don't want you to think about it. I just want you to do it. 
So for those that didn't hear, please get out of the shower, please pull over, get your phone ready, get a piece of paper, get your pen ready. What we're gonna do, and I did this on one of my client calls the other day, is you have three minutes. Three minutes, starting in just a second, to write what it feels like when you show up for yourself. What does it feel like when you go all in on yourself rather than caving into that insecurity? I'll say it one more time. You've got three minutes starting now to quickly write the first things that come to your, to your soul. What does it feel like when you show up for yourself? What does it look like? What does it taste like? What is it? What is it? What is the essence? What are the, what are the smells that you smell? What are the colors that you see? And, and when you're not diving into those insecurities, and I'm gonna do mine because I've done it a hundred times and I like doing it, so I'm gonna do it too. You guys can do it too. <laughs> I'm just gonna put myself on mute for a second. I'm gonna give everybody one more minute. All right. Um, I want you to, to read that a lot. Read it a lot. Um, look at it a lot. Put it on your mirror. I know it's super cliche. Read it, write it again, read it, write it again, make yourself do it. You know, the reason why I, I give you guys just three minutes or whatever is so you don't have, you don't have time to think. You just go in those, those, those words that come to your mind, just jotting them down and, and really feeling what it feels like to, to be all of you. Um, so once again, you know, my biggest takeaway for myself, because I'm learning that, <laughs> and for you guys is to show up for yourself, even when others don't show up for you or want you to show up for them in a different way. It doesn't work like that. It does not work like that. And if you can start showing up for yourself, more you will start to see completely new sides that you never knew and i once again i am so grateful for you everybody showing up here this has been my most vulnerable talk for everybody that knows me they probably haven't seen me cry <laughs> so it's very hard for me um to let people past my wall of vulnerability that i built um and i just want to say thank you for listening and this talk also was for me to hear it again and again and again. So thank you, Creative Mornings. And I'm, I'm so grateful for you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Hutch. That was amazing. I'm still crying over here. Um, you, hearing Hutch. about 
you know, how your parents evolved in their journey with you. Um, I think that's one of the most beautiful things. And, um, you know, not to detract from your message, because we're going to take questions from the audience. But in my heart, I'm hoping with everything that's happening in the world, that people's hearts will be opened. And those hard conversations will happen in all kinds of families across the country. And we will help bring more people along to help see the humanity in each other and to fight for that, you know? Um, so Michelle and Lindsay, if you guys wanna um, take some of the questions and, or if anybody's got questions, if you wanna pop in chat, we'll try to find you if you wanna ask it, we've got some time. I did see one question already float by and somebody asked me when you were talking about BCU Hutch, where your hometown was. So it's an easy oh. question. Yeah, my, my hometown is in Northern Virginia. Uh, I grew up in Sterling. Um, loved it there, so I'm a Nova girl. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I'm glad you're here though, because I get to know you. Uh, <laughs> so while, if you guys have a question, go ahead and drop it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll try to unmute you. But in the interim, you know, Hutch, you and I talked a little bit about this before. Yeah. Talk about how you bring creativity, how, how creativity is a security for you as well. Mm -hmm. Like you use creativity in different ways. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, so I have a therapist and she, we, we exp she explained to me that because as a child, I had to be so quick on my toes with hiding who I was and um, coping. I got really good at being creative, maybe a little bit too creative for my parents, AKA lying. <laughs> but um, that, that mechanism, that coping mechanism, I brought into my professional career of being able to solve problems very quickly in a good way on the field for my clients, for the kids, um, being able to help people think for themselves as, as well too, getting them to dig deeper, just like how Michelle helps me dig deeper. Um, but I would definitely say the biggest, you know, thing is being creative is so beautiful because it's so authentic. It's real, it's raw, it's not made up. Um, but it came from that coping of having to pivot as such as at a, such a young age. And so I brought that into my, my career and I love being creative, maybe too creative. <laughs> I don't think you're too creative at all. <laughs> yes. The sessions that we get to have are not too creative. There's always something new popping, which is great. I love Other that. questions. Yeah. Let's see, you had a lot of, you have a ton of comments. We're gonna save the chat too. So Dan yeah. asked, what are some of the things people wrote about showing up for themselves? I think people are uh, sharing. Hutch, what did you write today? Today I wrote- Some of the, some um, of the words that came up for you. It, it smells and feels pure. Mm -hmm. um, it, but at the same time, it also looks very raw and rugged. I truly feel that anything and everything is possible in those moments when I show up for myself. Those are some of the words that I wrote. Yep. Yeah. Something I wrote about you, everything's possible with Hutch. <laughs> yeah, I'm reading all these So you have, another, you have another question, did some of the personal, yeah. so PJ says, did some of the personal insecurities affect your sports performances? I'm sure they did. Um, it's so interesting to do that, that personal dive, but potentially, um, I was a player once again, that had to cope very quickly and I had to just get on the field and get it done, or at least attempt to get it done from, for myself and for my team. But I also struggled with many injuries. I had five surgeries between my knees and my my foot so potentially i think you know having to live in a space like that in by myself maybe have it had affected my health the way that i move and those types of things but soccer was you know sports they were it was my my outlet it was a way for me to to release all that that 
that energy that I had pent up from hiding and being in feeling insecure. Cause when I was on the court or I was on, on the, uh, the soccer field, I could just be, I could just play and I wasn't feeling judged or looked at differently. Uh, but I'm sure, I'm sure it affected me. I'm sure. So Carl asked, what was a common theme you saw in people's hearts when they, when they had the change? Uh, like, I guess it was when pe in people's hearts change. So what was common in their change toward you? Maybe. Um, they, they smelt the confidence. They smelt the, okay, like this is it. And I could sometimes see the wheels turning in their head like, oh, like this one. Because once I took myself more seriously and once I was able to stand firm on my two feet, let them know that I wasn't going anywhere. And by the time that I went off to the national team in Trinidad, being gay is illegal. So when I showed up, me, everyone was like, what the hell is going on? And it, and it, and it normalized it on my team for a lot of people and people were like you're crazy you like you're you you potentially could get killed for this and i'm like okay at that time i had already been in college and really accepted myself i didn't know showing up in another country you could get killed for that <laughs> um but i showed up so powerfully and so authentically that um other people started to show up for themselves i saw that and a lot of my teammates told me that and i didn't know that for a long time Beautiful. No. So quick question and then one last question. Did you play soccer, basketball, or both at VCU? Mm -hmm. So I played soccer at VCU. I did not play basketball, but I played basketball in high school. And what would you say to those high school seniors from bas the basketball team now? Yeah. And you know, Michelle. I kind of feel like maybe the, yeah. the story you told me this morning. Yeah the i had a girl reach out to me i think i was either a junior or senior in college and she wrote me this beautiful message on facebook and she it came out of nowhere and she was just like i want to let you know that i am so sorry i know we haven't spoken literally in years because she would have left when i was a sophomore in high school but she wrote me this beautiful note of that i'm beautiful and i she loves who i am was that she was battling some things inside and it was a release for her to um, manipulate or throw paper or do these things. She actually lost a friend to a, a serious act. And I think that's what was the turning point for her, that she was um, putting me in a position where that could have been me. Um, but I've seen some of those people. And if I had to say something to them, I think I would just tell them that I love them and that I'm thinking of them and that if they need anything, I am here because now I'm ready to stand on my own two feet.